What's up? This video is going to be pretty crazy. I haven't seen any videos on it, so I think it's going to make for a unique, interesting video. We're continuing with China Unveiled, so if you haven't seen part 1 or part 2, make sure you check that out first before you watch this one. I wanted to give a big shout out to Herman, who reached out to me and told me about this place, and then was willing to go on the ground and get some footage for us. That was really awesome of him, and I'm very appreciative of that because now we can get an idea of what this place looks like in person. With that, grab some snacks, sit back, and let's dive in. Today, we're going to be discussing a very strange structure in Colorado Springs, which looks like part of an old castle. It doesn't seem like too many people know about this except for the locals, but this structure is known as the Will Rogers Shrine of the Sun. And it's basically a five-story tower that was made to commemorate Will Rogers, which we'll get to him in a moment, because he's very suspicious. But apparently this structure was built and funded by a local philanthropist, Spencer Penrose, who was the guy also behind the nearby zoo and Broadmoor Hotel. He basically built and promoted the city, and one of the things he decided to do, according to the mainstream narrative, is build this massive tower on top of Cheyenne Mountain, which is known for having an underground military base, so there is a lot of weird stuff going on in the area. But the story that they give is just so weak, which really makes this structure stick out like a sore thumb. So the story goes that this structure was completed in 1937, and it was named after Will Rogers, a famous American Hollywood star and political comedian who died in a plane crash in Alaska in 1935. The tower is described as Romanesque Revival Architecture, apparently designed by Charles E. Thomas, which is another one of these suspicious architects with a huge portfolio, and apparently the shrine was also used as a tomb for Spencer Penrose and his wife, to essentially be immortalized. Okay, but what's so weird about this place? Well, there's a lot, and I guess let's just pretend like we're visiting it in person. The drive up there is kind of weird. You have to go through this long winding road, and to even visit the shrine, you have to get a ticket at the zoo, which is where most people go. But once you pass the zoo, you have to continue down this road and it just feels very empty and the vibe's kind of bizarre, like not too many people continue this far for whatever reason. But as you can see, the shrine is up there way above the city. The rocks and environment give an aura to the place. It's literally overlooking the entire city. Yet supposedly it's not a well-known tourist site, which is weird because of how beautiful it is. This is what it looks like as you pull up. There's this wall that goes around the entire structure, which we can talk about in a second. So you come through the entrance, and there's a sign that dedicates the highway to a Mr. Tut. Thought that was strange. But yeah, look at this. So you come in through the wall, and there's this massive arch that you have to enter through. There are cameras everywhere, and the design's very unique. Why do they decide to build it in this manner? Nothing in the story explains that aspect, as we'll see. There's also this strange metalwork that was interesting near the entrance. As you're about to enter, they have these rules, and also another sign explaining the mainstream history. That Penrose commissioned this entire structure just to memorialize his close friend, Will Rogers. Okay, so you enter, and then as you make your way to the shrine, there are these foo dogs, which seem so out of place, but for some reason, they decided to put these here before you enter the shrine, with no explanation as to why they're there. They are quite detailed as well, and they've been there since the beginning, yet there's nothing in the story that really explains why Penrose would have a fascination with Chinese culture, or why he would even want to include it in the shrine. Will Rogers wasn't Chinese, and neither was Penrose. But as we'll see, this shrine literally has medieval artifacts. So it is strange once you start to put it all together. Foo dogs? A wall that looks very similar to the Wall of China? You would think that they would have a better explanation on why they decided to do all of this, but no, this is all just for some famous American celebrity. Here are some close-up details of the sculpture. It's very interesting for sure. And they're also slightly different in what's in their hands. 
Then you can see the entire city from this view. But the weird thing is, is that this whole place is empty. Like the zoo is nearby and it always has a bunch of people, but rarely do people come up here. I was told it's like maybe two to four people every few hours. One of the interesting things too, is that there's this chime that you can hear and it really resonates. You can hear it from pretty far away. So there's definitely some type of resonance happening within the structure, which is also a chapel. Okay, let's start with the museum. It actually talks about this. So the most iconic feature of the shrine is that it has a technologically advanced sound system. It's called the Singing Tower. Penrose in 1938 installed a complex sound system made up of Westminster chimes and a Deegan clock. They later switched systems, but I just thought that was interesting. They literally have cathedral instruments in here so that the entire surrounding area could hear the music. Okay, but let's talk about more weirdness. It's so weird, in fact, that it was even featured in Ripley's Believe It or Not. Well, for one, apparently they're saying that this whole structure was built from a single block of pink granite, one massive boulder, yet they have no proof for this claim and no photos to back it up. Now, they have some photos of the construction of the arch, but literally only two photos. One of the photos doesn't even look like the same location, which the date says 1935, so remember that. And the photo of the arch looks so staged. You can even see the men in black with their hats laughing at this whole situation. I mean, you really think they just invested millions of dollars to create this as a memorial? Why? This is the best they're going to give us two photos? Well, it gets better because I'm not buying the story at all. So Spencer hired this architect Charles Thomas, and a crew of 30 men to construct this stone monolith. Which also, Charles Thomas was also responsible for many other strange buildings, including multiple Freemason lodges and high schools that seem to be a little too fancy to be just a high school. Also, as a side tangent, there is the Colorado Springs High School, which is so out of place. It was called the Old Stone School, and supposedly they built this in 1875. But of course, the school burned in 1890. But I thought this was very strange. It has the same Romanesque style of architecture, but from 40 years before the shrine. There are actually a bunch of structures in Colorado Springs that are out of place for the timeline they're telling us, like the Union Printer's Home, and the Antlers Hotel. We can save that for a deep dive on another occasion, but yeah. This Charles Thomas guy is your typical architect that they just assign all these structures to so that they can try to get away with this type of stuff. But apparently, this workforce of 30 men consisted of young men who needed jobs after the Great Depression. Charles Thomas wanted to import the granite as it would be much easier, so even Thomas knew this was going to be a big deal. But no, Penrose wanted to give the young men as much work as possible. So he decides that he's going to quarry this massive 100 foot boulder right from the rock of the mountain that the shrine was to sit on. So they got this granite from Pike's Peak, which is 700 feet above the building site. Which just seems insane, and why is there no photos of the process? They then chiseled it by hand into large blocks. 6,500 cubic yards of pink granite blocks were held together with 200,000 pounds of steel and 30 wagon loads of cement. Not a single nail was used to hold the structure together. Now keep in mind, they are doing this 8,000 feet above sea level and the tower is 114 feet tall. But the weird part is the amount of imports they had. Italian marble and terrazzo for decorating the floors, but why were they trying to be so fancy with it? Also, they even had a copper lightning rod at the top of the tower. But they say this was just homage to Spencer's prosperous copper mine. Oh yeah, and there's another Ripley's Believe It or Not talking about how this road is the most crooked road, seven miles long built in an area of one and a half square miles. Which this isn't related, I don't think, but there's this weird thing about a doll's hair that grew four inches. Okay, so then they have this view of the Cheyenne Mountain Highway. And what I thought was so strange is the names. 
you enter through a gate, then you go through Hell's Gate, and as you get to the top, there's a formation called the Devil's Horns. At the very top of the mountain is the Cheyenne Lodge Summit, which there doesn't seem to be anything strange about the architecture. However, I did notice that the base has some interesting stonework. Let's take note that this overlooks the Garden of the Gods. It's almost as if something cataclysmic happened here similar to the Grand Canyon. Look at this old photo of this balanced rock, which is in the Garden of the Gods, but you explain to me how that happens through erosion. I mean, what's going on here? There's actually a couple of strange rock formations that are out of place in this area. 40 minutes away is Castle Rock, Colorado, which is an entire city built around this out of place rock formation that literally looks like the remnants of a castle. Kind of like something you would see in Spain or Europe. There's even this old photo that called it an Indian face. Seems strange, and they have a bunch of antenna on it now. But there are multiple castle rocks. Like why would you even call it that? There's one in Utah that looks like an obvious remnant. And there's even one in Colorado Springs in South Cheyenne Mountain. It gets weird, I'm telling you, this is one big rabbit hole. Because I'm just talking about out of place structures. There's so much more to this place, like Tesla set up his first experimental station here, which according to the locals would send surges of power throughout the city causing blackouts and other ill effects. There's also this very strange America the Beautiful Park, which is blatantly Masonic. You have these obelisks with a stargate, but this is supposed to be a fantasy playground that is out of this world. The stargate has almost 400 spray jets, and is called the Continuum, the Julie Penrose Fountain. From above, it has this grand oval that looks bizarre. This is their master plan. Okay, but let's go back to the museum and the shrine. Strangely, there's this picture of the shrine from Julie's shack, and they decided to show a picture to the left dated 1926, which is an opening ceremony for the Cheyenne Lodge. In the old photos, it was kind of an old adobe style, but you can also see the stonework that I was talking about. This is at the summit, so we know there was a lodge up there. Hmm. So let's talk about Spencer Penrose for a moment. He's one of these philanthropist entrepreneurs that would build entire cities. He's responsible for the Broadmoor, the Cheyenne Mountain Highway, the zoo, the lodge at the summit, and the shrine. This whole story is strange. Apparently he comes from this prominent family in Philadelphia, which Penrose is a Freemasonic last name. Spencer himself, as far as we know, is not a Mason, but his family was known to be politicians. The Penrose man attended Harvard and Spencer was the bottom of his class. He didn't want to be like his brothers. Rather, he decided to travel west and make a career out on the frontier basically trying to say that this was all random, and that he just started the Utah Copper Company in 1903, establishing mining operations in Arizona, New Mexico, Nevada. The story goes that Spencer migrated to New Mexico, started some businesses but then selling them so that he could cut his losses and try again. This is where one of his old time friends, Charles Tutt, which there really isn't that much info on him, but Tut tells Penrose about how there was this potential gold rush in Colorado. So this Tut guy, right, King Tut, is responsible for developing Colorado Springs, along with another founder called William Jackson Palmer. So Tut then loans Penrose the money to purchase a half stake in his Cripple Creek real estate business. Hmm, that seems very generous. And this property had a cash on delivery mine which was one of the most successful in Cripple Creek. They then sold the mine and invested the money in a new venture, an ore processing facility in old Colorado City. Interesting name for a new city, but okay. So they basically ended up repeating this process until they found a massive copper deposit in Utah. This led them to fully building their enterprise and they mined more copper than they even imagined was possible. So after he got rich off the mines, Spencer, or Spec as he was called, returned to Colorado Springs to build the Broadmoor. He originally wanted to buy the Antlers Hotel, 
which they say was rebuilt in 1901 after a fire. Now the Broadmoor that was supposedly built by Penrose in 1918 is not the original. There was a Broadmoor Casino, which supposedly was completed in 1897. It was described as having, quote, grounds for polo and golf games, pigeon shooting, and gambling. The resort and casino were fashioned for wealthy guests, and the buildings had European architecture, end quote. Interestingly, the wiki doesn't say anything about what happened to the casino, but the Broadmoor website says that the casino burned down in 1897, so it was basically destroyed as soon as they finished. Seems odd. Well, another thing that I wanted to point out from the museum is that there was mention of Indian tribes in this area that were pushed out by the white settlers. But then it has this lore called the God and the Dragon. It talks about how there was a great flood in this area, and that the god Manitou sent the dragon named Thirst down to drink up the water so that the people could once again flourish and live off the land. However, it was so much water that the dragon couldn't make it back up to the heavens, so the dragon Thirst fell back to the ground, dying and spreading pestilence throughout the land. The people pleaded to their god Manitou to help them, so he gave the spring healing powers and the land and people thrived. But get this, Manitou then turned the dragon to stone, so petrified, and where he lay is known as the Cheyenne Mountains. So literally in the legend of the native Indians of the area, they're telling you that the mountains are some type of petrified object. I mean, they're telling you this in the museum. So since we were talking about the Broadmoor, Let's continue with that train of thought because there are some more interesting connections to these philanthropists. Well, I didn't mention, but the place is said to be haunted. I was reading some haunted websites and they were saying that people argue on whether there was a fire or not. Which is strange because Wiki is saying that there was a streetcar line that went to the casino in 1898. But apparently, people see a woman in old 1900s clothing and they believe her to be the Countess Portalis the wife of the Count who built the original casino building. Some people say that there are some really bad vibes here, but who is this Count that built the original European style casino? Well, this isn't something that was easy to find, but apparently one of the most prominent and active figures in the early history of Colorado Springs was a Count James de Portales. He's the builder of the Broadmoor Casino founder and first president of the Cheyenne Mountain Country Club, and one of the first men to invest any considerable amount of money in the Cripple Creek District. This guy came from an elite family, whose father was Count Charles Portales, a master of ceremonies of the court of Berlin. The Portales possessed the title of Count in Prussia, Austria, France, and apparently Colorado Springs. The title was originally created in 1750 by the King of Prussia. I'm bringing up the Broadmoor because it's one of Penrose's projects and it's mentioned at the shrine. But there is something else that's interesting. Oh, they have this model of the shrine that shows it at a smaller scale, which is pretty cool. Interesting to see it at this point of view. But there is this label talking about some of the attractions built by Penrose that no longer exist. One that caught our attention is the Broadmoor Ice Palace. Now if you look this up, you'll get shown the Broadmoor World Arena. But apparently there used to be a structure that looked like this, which I can't really find any other photos of it, which is very strange. You would think if Penrose worked on this, we would know more about the original structure. All I could find was this old postcard, which looks completely different from the World Arena from the 1930s. So I'm not sure what date this old photo is from, as it isn't mentioned, and you can't really see it in the photo. But yeah, there's no explanation as to what this structure is. I found this extremely interesting because they mention this ice palace on the model of the shrine, and there's a plaque outside that mentions it as well. So what was this place? Well, it gets crazier because this is not the only ice palace in Colorado. Now this story is insane. So in Leadville, Colorado, which is a few hours away from Colorado Springs, 
you have this town which in the 1890s was going bankrupt, so they needed some type of attraction to bring people in. This is according to the mainstream story. So they decide to build a massive ice palace at the top of the mountain. And this is just crazy. So they built this in only 36 days, apparently using only 5,000 tons of ice. The palace held a skating rink, a restaurant, a ballroom, a dance floor, gaming rooms, and a carousel house. Some of the photos of this place are really interesting, and you can see how much went into the project. But it's just so bizarre that you would spend all this money to build this palace just for it to melt three months later. There's something off about seeing this level of architecture made from ice. Some of the photos are pretty insane. And supposedly they hoisted the ice blocks into place and covered them with boiling water which froze faster than cold water. I only found one real photo of the construction and it's a close up with blacked out builders. So it does seem very odd and out of place. Some of these photos show so much detail. And honestly, I wonder if maybe it's not ice, but some type of crystal. They actually refer to it as a crystal castle. There's a level of glossiness on the blocks that seemed to be more of the quality of a quartz or glass. It was called Colorado's Crystal Carnival. So who knows, maybe there's something they aren't telling us about this place. They even threw a whole parade for the opening, so it was a huge deal. It seems weird that they would put this much effort for one single event and for it to never happen again. It was the most extensive ice structure ever built. Here is a photo of an up close shot of some of the blocks and they don't really seem to be ice to me. Seems weird that they would build a structure of this magnitude for a small city of 10,000 people just for the entire project to fail. Now you may think I'm reaching, but it is known to be a mining city, and crystal palaces are mentioned in Marco Polo's journey. He actually describes the palace of Kublai Khan, which we discussed in part 1. Well, according to Marco Polo, Kublai Khan had a palace that resembled crystal. Marco Polo described Kublai Khan's palace as the greatest he had ever seen, covered in gold and silver, and adorned with intricate sculptures and paintings. The palace was so large that it could easily accommodate 6,000 people in its main hall, with an untold number of additional rooms. The roof of the palace was covered with vermilion, yellow, green, blue, and other hues, and it shone like crystal in the sunlight. The palace's exterior was so strongly built that Polo considered it fit to last forever. Interestingly, even Presser John, who we also discussed in part 1, was a wealthy king believed to have dwelt in Asia. He was king over many kings, and supposedly, he lived in a crystal palace with walls made of gold. Crystal palaces have been discussed in several legends and folklore. Perhaps it's not that far of a reach to suggest that there's something else going on with this ice palace. Also, speaking of Colorado palaces, there is the Colorado Mineral Palace opened in July 1891 in Pueblo, Colorado. Now this place is crazy, because for one you have this main depiction that shows it to be massive, but then you have these exterior photos that show something quite different in size, and there are also no buildings surrounding it. Which is weird because there seems to be contrasting information on just how big this building really was. What's truly fascinating is the interior. It looks like something out of a movie. Massive pillars with ornate details and domed ceilings. Why build something this extravagant? It even says in the mainstream story that the building and the gardens quickly went from costly to impossible to maintain. Ownership of the building changed regularly and by the 1920s had already fallen into disrepair. Now the globes on the pillars seem to be obvious Freemason symbols. However, there's no specific mention of them being involved, but for some reason, Colorado's mining barons just randomly decided to pour their wealth into erecting a palace here, a temple to the minerals that made their fortunes, but nothing remains today. So they made this just to show off, quote, everything of interest or value belonging to the mineral kingdom, end quote. 
which included a list of everything from precious metals and gems to rocks and fossils. It is even described as having an Egyptian architectural style, which is a common theme in many Freemasonic lodges and theaters. To make it even more apparent, there is the King Cole and Silver Queen. The King Cole of Trinidad is this black king sitting on a throne. These were royal statues, which the king sponsored the city of Trinidad. They also have cigar boxes with this guy, but apparently he stood 16 feet tall. The Silver Queen was 18 feet tall and paid for by the city of Aspen. But there's actually more to this story with these figures. Well, apparently the Silver Queen was actually moved to the Chicago World's Fair. Then after that, it disappeared, and it's still a mystery to this day. Now remember the story of Cheyenne Mountain and how it's said to be a petrified dragon? Well, this is pretty mind-blowing. Apparently, the Silver Queen is referencing the Aspen Mountain, which was coined by town pioneers in the 1880s when they first saw her reclining in the West Aspen Mountain. I mean, look, you can see it quite clearly. It looks like a lady's face, and she's laying on her back looking like she's sleeping. Now, I don't know what to make of that. I'm not saying it's a petrified human, but who knows? It's just fascinating to see that this is what the Silver Queen is referring to. While she was in display in the Mineral Palace, there was a stag and cherub right by her, which is more Masonic references. She is in a stag chariot, and she's holding a staff or wand with a star at the top with an eye. Interestingly, there was a Silver Queen at the Chicago World's Fair, but it was Montana's Silver Queen, not Aspen's. So this whole thing of where the Silver Queen went is a big mystery. They even had wanted posters. Another detail of the palace was that the dome was decorated with paintings of eight great Americans, but no one remembers who these people were. Between the large statues was a stage where many plays were conducted. Apparently the stage was designed to resemble the interior of a cave or mine. It seems that there may be a connection to these mining operations and masonry, as evident by the Great Seal of Colorado. Definitely seems like a center for the elite to come together for banquets and other activities. But yeah, I found this place so odd. Why build a palace for minerals and hide its Freemasonic influence? Okay, well let's come back to the tower because there are still some things that I need to mention. Well, it's called Will Rogers Shrine of the Sun. And it doesn't really make that much sense on why that is. I mean, why not just call it the Penrose Shrine? Which, I already find it strange that Spencer was already a part of multiple country clubs, but he had his own private social club, the Cooking Club, with other influential and elite figures, such as a Horace and a Harry, who were buried at the shrine alongside Spencer and Julie. Just seems strange that you would invest all this money and effort so that you could dedicate it to a close personal friend, Will Rogers, which as the story goes, Will Rogers had a sudden and unexpected death in a plane crash in Alaska. But who was this Will Rogers guy? And why are there foo dogs at the front entrance? Well, during this time, America was obsessed with this Will Rogers guy. He was basically like the biggest celebrity. He was the highest paying actor in Hollywood. He had a radio show, and he wrote articles for the New York Times with his own short column, Will Rogers Says. He also happened to have the largest funeral service since Abraham Lincoln, so he was a pretty big deal. Here's the last known photograph right before he died, and I thought it was weird that this guy has an eye patch. That is Wiley Post, the guy who died with Rogers, and I just find it strange, like, why was this guy flying a plane with an eye patch? That doesn't seem that safe, or maybe there's something else going on here. What's even more suspicious about this whole thing is that Will Rogers was a 33rd degree Freemason. Yet I didn't really see any mention of that at the shrine. Maybe I missed it, but seems like something you might want to throw out there. It's not even on his wiki page, so why would you hide this information? 
There is even a bust of him in the Masonic Hall in New York City. But he also has his own Masonic lodges still today where people can become Masons under his name. Which by the way, his middle name also happens to be Penn strangely. This used to be the Claremore Lodge where he was made a Mason, surprisingly becoming a master Mason in less than a year. Shrines are also quite common in Freemasonry. They're literally called the Shriners, and singular is a shrine, which they have different clubs and grades. Typically they are called shrine clubs. So if you ask me, no, I don't think the story they're telling at the Shrine of the Sun and how they dedicated it to Will Rogers because he was just an awesome guy and loved by America is the full story. They're definitely keeping something secret about this structure. There are a few more things that I wanted to mention. They have these murals that are called Memories of a Lifetime in the Pikes Peak region, which seems like more propaganda, but some of it is a really bad vibe. It's kind of the same vibe as the Denver Airport mural, but that's its own beast. Well, it seems connected since Will Rogers did die in a plane crash, but forgetting all that. The mural is so out of place for such a place of beauty. It makes no sense to have people dying, blood, and a great fire. Then there's the chapel, which also makes no sense, because Spencer was agnostic. And the only explanation they give us for the foo dogs and this Chinese god statue in the chapel is that Spencer decorated the grounds of the shrine with relics that he acquired during his travels to China. Wait, really? That's it? A single sentence that explains nothing on why there's literally a statue of the Chinese goddess Quan Yin at the entrance of the chapel. There are a few more interesting details that discuss how the foo dogs were carved in stone in a Chinese style but no reason to why they're there. And for some reason, he wanted the monument to, quote, look like a fortress with a stone turret around the top of the ledge, end quote. But apparently, Julie Penrose wanted to make this place look really nice since it's where she was going to spend eternity. So they ended up importing 16th century and 17th century relics. Like what? They literally have Renaissance oil paintings a Flemish stained glass window, and a bunch of old wood, including this old wooden door where it looks kind of like the Biltmore. They just have all this stuff for no good reason, but this is even more out of place when you consider it's just a couple. Doesn't really make a lot of sense on why you would invest so much to build something, all just to dedicate it to a Freemason. There's also a subterranean chamber where the chimes were originally installed. So it just seems bizarre. You have this shrine on the top of a mountain, connected with secrets. The entire shrine is surrounded by a wall that is very similar to the wall of China in appearance. And the entrance and chapel is guarded by Chinese relics. What are you supposed to make of all that? Especially when we consider it should be much more popular and yet barely anyone knows about it. So what is it then, just a super fancy gravestone? But then why dedicate the name to another person? Anyways, let us know what you think. Is there any other details that you happen to know about this place or anything nearby? If you have anything to share, please do leave a comment or reach out. If you would like to support our work, please share the channel and tell your friends. Hope you all enjoyed that, and all we can hope is that our minds may be unveiled. Let go of everything you think to be true. Relax the mind and ask the question. Do I truly understand what this reality is?